This lesson covers section 5.2 from the text and talks about factoring algebraic expressions. Now the first thing we always want to try to do when we're factoring is to see if there's a greatest common factor. That will make the coefficients a lot smaller and easier to work with. It can also help us with other methods of factoring such as the AC method. So in this case, um, we have a few examples here. If we're given an example such as 24x squared plus 12x minus 6, you can see that they all have a 6 in common, and that's it. So if you factor that out, the thing to be careful with here is that when you factor out the 6, you're left with a 4x squared. Uh, if you factor out the 6 from the 12, you end up with a 2x. And the thing that a lot of people forget about is you also need this minus 1 because you need to be able to make sure that you could reproduce this negative 6 if you were to multiply it all the way through. Just because you factored it out doesn't mean it's not there anymore. It still needs something to be multiplied by to get it back to the original form. So in this case, we end up with a negative 1. Uh, likewise, in the example here, 8x squared minus 24x, they both have an 8 in common. They also have an x in common. So we can factor out variables as well. And in that case, we would end up with 8x times the quantity. We would have an x left here, and we would have a 3 left in the second term. So we'd end up with x minus 3 as our binomial here. So let's try a few examples. First example here, we have 2x minus 16. So if you look at that, they both have a 2 in common. And if you factor that out, you're left with an x in the first term and 8 in the second term. And again, essentially what you're doing is you're taking each term and dividing by the factor that you've pulled out. So in this case, 2x divided by 2 would leave you with x. 16 divided by 2 would leave you with 8. Another example, if you look at these here, take a second to look at these and see if you can see what they have in common. Hopefully you notice that they all actually have a 12 in common. Some people might be inclined to see the 6 first, uh, which is true, but there's also a 12. Um, the, the full 12 is actually a common factor. Uh, so we would factor out the 12. If you look at the variables, uh, not all of them have an x. This last term doesn't have an x. Uh, not all of them have a y because this middle term is missing a y, but they all have a z. There's a z, cubed, and cubed. So we can factor out a z as well. So when we do that, uh, 60 divided by 12 is 5, and then we are left with our x squared and our y cubed, and we already factored out the z. For the second term, uh, the 12 divided by 12 would be 1, and then we have our x and z cubed divided by z, which leave us with a z squared. Last but not least, the 48 divided by 12 would leave us with a negative 4. We've got our y squared, and again, the z cubed divided by z would leave us with a z squared. So that is our greatest common factor that we could pull out, and the remaining terms. So just a refresher from the last section when we talked about the difference of perfect squares. Again, if you have x plus y times x minus y, this expands out to be x squared minus y squared. So if we wanted to go backwards from this, if we saw x squared minus y squared, we could go back and factor this to be x plus y, x minus y. So then we've got the two things that we would multiply together, which are known as factors. Uh, something to keep in mind, x squared plus y squared can't be factored in the real number system. It can be factored in the complex system with imaginary numbers, but not in the real number system, which is what we're concerned with at this point. So if we look at this first example, these are all going to be examples of difference of perfect squares. And usually when you see two terms and there's a subtraction between them, First thing you want to do is see if there's a greatest common factor. That's what you should do for any factoring problem. Once you're done with that, you should see if they're perfect squares because when you've got two terms, um, pretty much your only options are difference of perfect squares or difference or sum of perfect cubes. So in this case, we have 16b squared minus a squared. And in this case, 16b squared is a perfect square of 4b and a squared is a perfect square of a. So we have 4b plus a, 4b minus a. I'll do another example here with you. In this case, we have a common factor, and that is 9. You could go through because these are both perfect squares, but we always want to take out the common factor first. 
So we factor out that 9, we are left with x squared minus 9y squared. And then if we factor it again, the 9 stays out front. Um, x squared is a perfect square. 9y squared is the perfect square of 3y. So we get x plus 3y, x minus 3y. I'm going to do one more example here with you, and then I want you guys to try one. a squared, b squared, minus c squared. These are all perfect squares, and we've got a difference. So this is the difference of ab plus c and ab minus c. So this time, I want you to pause the video and try example 13. So for this one, you should have noticed that there was a 4 in common between the coefficients and that they both have an x to the 4th. So you can factor out a 4x to the 4th, which would leave you with 25 minus 16x squared. That factors down into being 5 plus 4x and 5 minus 4x. So your total answer, your final answer, is 4x to the 4th times 5 plus 4x times 5 minus 4x. And it doesn't matter which order you put the 5 plus 4x and the 5 minus 4x in. You could also write this as 4x to the 4th times 5 minus 4x times 5 plus 4x. That's also legitimate. As long as you have the 5 and the 4x in the same position, they should be first and second, corresponding to the original problem. But the plus or the minus can go um, first or second. You're multiplying, so those terms can be um, commuted. Uh, another tool that is helpful when it comes to factoring is what's sometimes called reverse FOIL. And essentially what you're doing, when you FOIL things out, you do first outer, inner, last. And that outer and inner piece add together as like terms. And then the last term is squared. And when you FOIL, so you have the outer and inner piece that can be added together as like terms. And then the last piece is the multiplication of those two last terms. And so in that case, you want to find two terms that multiply together to give you your last term and add together to give you your middle term. So, can you think of any factors of negative 12? Again, when I say factor, I mean two numbers that we can multiply together to get negative 12, that when we add them together, we get 4. Usually with these, if the coefficient on x squared is 1, and we just put the x in the first part of the parentheses, and usually the reverse FOIL method only works well when you've got um, a coefficient of 1 on your squared term. So in this case, uh, we say, okay, factors of negative 12. Well, there's 2 and 6. One of them has to be negative, and that would actually work out. If we have a positive 6 and a negative 2, those would multiply together to give us negative 12, and they would add together 6 minus 2 would give us 4 in the middle. So if you were to check this, then you would say, okay, x squared the outer is minus 2x, the inner is 6x, and the last is negative 12. Like I said, indeed, we end up with negative 2 and positive 6 being 4x, and the negative 12 at the end. Got another example here, m squared plus 11m plus 30. So we'll put the m in the first part of the parentheses. And now we need two numbers that multiply together to give us 30 and add together to give us 11. So hopefully you see that this is 6 and 5. The numbers that we need are 6 and 5. And both of them are positive in this case because they're multiplying to give a positive and adding to give a positive. So m plus 6, m plus 5. Again, if you wanted to check, you would have m squared. The outer would be 5m. The inner would be 6m. And the last would be 30. So again, the 5 and 6m would give us 11m in the middle. So just kind of a little rule or whatever to help us out in general. If we have um, the last term as positive, then when we factor out, the terms that we end up with are going to match whatever the middle term sign was. So the sign on the terms when we factor is going to end up being the same as the sign when um, on our middle term. Uh, instead, if we have a last term that is negative, that would mean we would need one term that was negative and one term that was positive 
because when you multiply them together, that would give you a negative number. So in that case, no matter what the middle sign is, one of these terms is going to be positive and one of these terms is going to be negative. Let's try a few more examples here. Uh, in this next one, our last term is negative. So if you go back up here, you say, okay, well, no matter what, we're going to end up with one being positive and one being negative. So we'll keep that in mind. So in this case, we've got A and A factors of negative 40 that add to be negative 3. So take a second to think about it. You should see that it ends up being negative 8 and positive 5 because the negative 8 and positive 5 will multiply to be negative 40 and add to be negative 3. So I want you to pause the video here for a second and try the next two examples. So for example 17, the last term is positive and the middle term is negative, meaning you need two negative numbers to multiply together to give you a positive 14. The only factors of 14 other than 1 and 14 are 7 and 2, and they both need to be negative. When you do add them together, you get the negative 9 in the middle. For 18, anytime you've got an exponent as your leading term other than 2, it has to be an even power in order to do this factoring in this way. Um, but essentially all you do is you take half of that exponent. So in this case, we would have t squared and t squared. And you do the same process. You say what factors of 36 we're going to add to be negative 13. In this case, it ends up being negative 9 and negative 4. The nice thing about this is that we also end up getting two difference of perfect squares. t squared minus 9 is a perfect square, and it factors to be t plus 3, t minus 3. And t squared minus 4 factors to be t plus 2, t minus 2. So we always want to make sure that we've factored it completely. Uh, the best way to check is to see that if you've got exponents of just 1 on all your terms, or you've got a greatest common factor out front that has an exponent that's higher, uh, it is possible that sometimes these exponents that are higher than 1 can't be factored any further. But anytime you see an exponent higher than 1, you want to check to see if you can do another step. You can't always, but sometimes you can. I've got a few more examples here. Um, this next one might be a little bit more challenging to see because we don't have a coefficient of 1 on our squared term. Uh, but it's actually not too bad because there's only so many factors of 4. There's only 1 and 4 and 2 and 2. So you can go through a method called guess and check if you want to, which essentially is exactly what it sounds like. You say, okay, I'm going to try 1 and 4, and then some factors of 9, and then I'm, if those don't work, then I'm going to go to 2 and 2, and the other factors of 9 until I figure out which one it is. So essentially, you're guessing some options and checking to see if they work. It can take a little bit of time, uh, but usually you end up getting it to work out. In this case, I know that this is going to be 2a and 2a, and if I look at 9, I'm going to try 3 and 3 because there aren't a whole lot of options for 9 either. And it ends up working out okay when we check it. So this was my guess and this is my check. If I do that I end up with 4a squared, the outer is 6a, the inner is 6a, and the last is 9. And so if you recall this is actually one of the examples of the perfect square trinomial where you end up with um, this simplified would actually be 2a plus 3 quantity squared because we've got the same factor here twice. So this next example is also a perfect square trinomial. I want you to pause the video here and see if you can figure it out. So if you work this one, you should have ended up with x squared minus 7 quantity squared uh, because you've an x squared minus 7 and an x squared minus 7, uh, the only factors of 49 other than 1 and 49 are 7 and 7, so you end up with this. And as far as factoring this further, uh, technically it can be, but not if you want to end up with whole numbers as, um, part of your, uh, as part of your factor. So this one's okay to stop if you wanted to go further. Um, x squared minus 7 would technically factor to be x plus the square root of 7, x minus the square root of 7. Uh, and then you would have this twice, so this whole thing would be squared if you wanted to. But if you want to just keep it with whole numbers and not deal with radicals, then you keep it as x squared minus 7 uh, squared. So we have a few more examples of these perfect square trinomials. 
And again, the way that you can tell is if you take the first one, the square root, which would be 3, the square root of 9 is 3, the square root of 49 is 7. You multiply these together, you get 21. If you double that, you get your 42. So in this case, we would say that this is 3y plus 7, 3y plus 7, or if you wanted to write it as 3y plus 7, it would be a little more compact. Again, if possible, we want to always want to see if there's a greatest common factor. In example 21, there was not, so we couldn't do anything uh, as far as the greatest common factor. We could just go straight to the perfect square trinomial. I want you to pause the video here for a second and see if you can figure out the next two examples. So for these last two examples, you should have ended up with b squared minus 10, b squared minus 10, or b squared minus 10 squared. Again, you want factors of 100 that are going to add to be negative 20, in this case, negative 10 and negative 10. And since you have the same term twice, you can just say b squared minus 10 quantity squared. Again, in this case, we had a b to the fourth, so that split in half to be b squared and b squared, which worked out because we had a b squared in the middle here, and that's what we needed. For this last example here, uh, both first and last terms have variables, and that's fine. Uh, if you say the square root of 25 is 5, and you've got the square root of x is x, um, and then on the other side, you've got the square root of y is y, so in this case, 5x minus y, 5x minus y. If you wanted to check this one, you would say, okay, 5x times 5x, so the first term is 25x squared. The outer term is minus 5xy, the inner term is minus 5xy, and the last term is y squared. We end up with what we started. So our factored form is 5x minus y quantity squared. This is the conclusion for this section 5.2. Go online now and complete your homework for this section, and then go on to the video for 5.3.